everyone. Hello and welcome to today's session. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Anna Bogutskaya. I'm a writer and a film programmer and I'll be hosting today's event and I'm delighted to be doing so. So welcome to creating the visual world of Chernobyl, which is part of BAFTA Television, the, the sessions supported by TCL. And thank you so much for TCL for supporting the series. This virtual series celebrates some of the nominees and nominated programs from this year's Virgin Media British Academy Television Awards and the British Academy Television Craft Awards. And today's session is all about crafting the visual world of Chernobyl, a huge monumental achievement of a series that has garnered 14 nominations across both events. So before we start, I just want to make sure we're all aware of some housekeeping rules. So these virtual events are part of BAFTA's learning work to share the expertise from TV, film and games with audiences far and what far and wide, excuse me. Check out BAFTA.org and BAFTA social channels for more activity and more news of upcoming events. We're also streaming this event live on YouTube and Facebook, and you can join the conversation on social media as well using the hashtag BAFTA TV sessions. If you've got a question throughout the series, um, I'll be monitoring the Q&A function, so make sure to pop your questions in the Q&A function, not the chat. And closed captioning is available from now, which you can turn on at the bottom of your screen. So that's it for housekeeping rules, and I am extremely excited to welcome our speakers for today. So joining us today are Odile dix Moreau, the costume designer, Daniel Parker, hair and makeup designer, Barry Gower, prosthetic supervisor, Jacob Ears, cinematographer, Luke Hull, production designer, Claire Levinson, Gentler, set designer, and Sane Willenberg, producer. And thank you each one of you so much for giving up a bit of your time uh, to share your expertise and your insight on the making of Chernobyl. And first of all, heartfelt, absolute congratulations on your work on the series. It's uh, extraordinary. Um, I've got a million questions and thoughts for you, but I'm gonna to try to keep it brief and as succinct as possible um, to make sure that everyone who's joining us today has some time to ask you all as well some questions. So. Um, I hope you're all safe and you're all well. And just to kick off the conversation, uh, can you talk to us a little bit about how you got involved in a project and what did you, what drew you to it? Anyone who wants like to start? To speak. You know? Who would you like to speak? Uh, fantastic scripts. Um, just, you know, when you read them, you just think this is really exciting to work on. Um, mm. And just you're drawn totally into the scripts and you're swept up along it and you just couldn't stop reading them when I first got them. So it was quite easy decision to want to be part of the project. Also one of these really rare moments when you get not only something that was extraordinarily well written and captivating you know, as, a, as a piece of television, as a piece of entertainment in the wider sense, but also something that actually dared to deal with a, a subject that is incredibly close to my heart and it's just the kind of stories that need to be told. Um, you know, living, growing up in a world where kids don't even get told about this huge disaster that is very recent history in school made it really relevant to, to try and bring this story to the screen and raise awareness that it's not forgotten. Um, so kind of to continue on from that and picking up on your really, really important point, um, were you, in your preparation for the series and for creating the, the visual language of it, uh, were you able to go visit Chernobyl or, or what kind of research did you do to, to learn more about the disaster? Because, I mean, I think everyone can answer this, but we started, it was very far reaching the research because it it's a subject that we thought well I thought I knew about but I very quickly realized I didn't know very little about it indeed but we didn't go to Chernobyl and we didn't need to because a lot of what we were uh, dealing with was set at the time of the explosion a lot of that famous imagery wasn't really relevant for us of the sort of years after and de decrepit Pripyat so um, but it was as wide as kind of books and reading material and, and material that Craig had assimilated anyway as a kind of package to write the script and then we we had sort of street photography from the Soviet time we um, there's a lot of videos on YouTube of actual like the cleanup of the roof is out there to view and um, 
and scouting. I mean, we were filming in that part of the world anyway, so we were getting into people's homes and locations that were truly inspiring for the, the aesthetic of what we were trying to go for. And we were quite fortunate that um, the Lithuanian teams, a lot of them could speak Russian, so they accessed a lot of extraordinary stuff through being able to read Russian. So, and, and then Luke and I, we went to Kiev and went to the actual Chernobyl Museum, which was really interesting and spoke to um, uh, people there. And I think, Sana, I mean, some people even met some of the people who actually worked some liquidators, there. yes. Yeah. I think, you know, we all knew right from the start, you know, authenticity, you know, was, was yeah. something that was truly important to tell the story. And of course, you find your filmic language and your look within that, you know, but it really was, you know, to, to really you know, make it, you know, it was such a, you know, Craig's storytelling is so experiential and it, and, and it, he really kind of puts you there with, and tells the story from all these numbers of, uh, of, you know, varying people that are involved from in so many different ways and to kind of be true and make it feel that for the people that experienced it, that this is, you know, the world that they lived in and this is what it was, you know, had to really translate into every element. So, you yeah. know, whether it's the photographic look that, you know, Jakob and, and Johan kind of curated or the, you know, the grueling and endless um, uh, research Daniel and Barry and their teams had to do in order to create the horrific, you know, after, you know, rooms and, and you know, results of, of contamination. It, 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 it really was a huge labor of love on every department and in a very exciting story and a harrowing story and a humbling story and and i am i really think i mean i'm blessed to work with these very talented people that really delivered you know more than we could have ever hoped for i think we were trying to make it more russian than the russians would have ever done it <laughs> yeah there was that split was it? we didn't want to make a western idea yeah. we didn't make a nostalgic russian Piece. I did actually want to pick you up and actually really congratulate you on the on the visual and material language that's in the film. It does really feel like representative of a Soviet aesthetic that does not feel westernized or kitsch in any way. It feels incredibly um, everyday and familiar. So can you talk a little bit about your process of creating that visual world without um, being you know, emphasizing the authenticity of the Soviet aesthetic at that point um, without um, making it kind of West, too westernized. Yeah. I would, I would say we were really lucky because Luke and Daniel were just fantastic to work with. I mean, that doesn't always work, but, you know, I could talk, go and talk to Luke, Luke could talk, and I could go and then talk to Daniel. And then if, even if we couldn't be always in the right places at the time, we kind of helped each other. So say Daniel was deep in wounds, I would kind of be looking at the crowd and then chat to Daniel. You know, it was just a really, a really um, amazing process to work with us, with all of them, yeah. I, I have to say that working, working with Odile and her costumes, I mean, in combination with the makeup, uh, was absolutely amazing because an enormous amount of time was put to making it correct and we were based in 1986, but this is Russia in late 70s. Mm -hmm. So you have to do an enormous amount of research to make it work. And we found that everybody, Odil had to dress everybody. I had to put wigs on almost everybody uh, in order to make it look right. Um, and yeah, it's, uh, it, was, it was quite a challenge because it all ended up being much bigger, much more complicated than we expected or than you can actually see because it actually I'm very very happy to say that it all looks real I mean there's no doubting that it is where it is and in, in the time that it is in I mean, so just to, everyone did an amazing job sorry Dan just to say that Daniel just mentioned that although it's the 80s you were looking at the 70s and for in terms of what we were doing in in dressing some of the locations mm -hmm. We were looking at a lot earlier because everything in Russia was kind of standardized. There was a certain amount of furniture we were limited in, but then also, it, although we were in the 80s, everything kind of went back almost even to the 50s. We looked at 50s and 60s to actually dress it with some of the objects because that was 
that was Russia. And we went actually, as part of our research, we went to Ukraine, looked in lots of people's apartments and still the kinds of decor that we put in it is still how a lot of people still live in Russia. I think there's a point you made about what authenticity is as well, though, because we, well, we strive to be authentic and we did work incredibly close together. And like Adil says, I completely agree. It was a real pleasant experience to work with everyone on this job. But the, um, it's authentic, it feels authentic because it's coherent as well. And uh, mm -hmm. Johan came with uh, some very strong tonal images at the beginning. And I think we weren't making a documentary. We never set out to do that. And, and I think yeah, yeah, Jacob spelled this as well uh, when we talked about it. But it's, um, we were looking to sort of strike a tone of our own that was both sort of sickening and represented the story of what everyone was going for and also felt sort of very raw and real. And so we made decisions on that basis alongside making decisions on the basis of what was authentically correct for the period. So it, 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 that authenticity, I think, it feels stronger because across all of the various sets and stages of the show, it, there's a strong coherence, which only came about because I think we work so closely together. But. Mm -hmm. They also think, you know, Jakob, yeah, um, um, you know, the, your approach to lighting and, you know, and kind of, you know, yeah, it was just a really extraordinary one because you, you even managed to kind of, you know, kind of personify or kind of, you know, represent the unseen enemy, you know, in, a, in your, in your, in how you approach the whole lighting thing. But, you know, I think it was just a real, you know, an element that really helped bring everything together, all the fantastic designs. Yeah. I, do, I do think, oh, sorry, yeah, you, you go. Oh, no, sorry, no, I mean, it's interesting about uh, creating reality or creating the past. Uh, you know, in some way, it's, it's a lot of contradictions at the same time. Maybe we should have, you know, maybe we should have all spoken in Russian if we want to be really true to the project. But, yes. but of course, you can't be. And, and maybe we should have shot on 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 celluloid on on film to be really authentic. So there's so many. There's so many. It's a fine balance, I guess, of what is authenticity. But I guess, just like Luke and what what we all said, is that you gather information, and you try to, you know. And then uh, you try to be true to that, but of course you you drift away from that. Mm -hmm. But hopefully you don't drift too far off if you still have some knowledge uh, to to begin with. So um, yeah, so there, I mean there are a lot of I guess there are some props or there's some you know, lighting which are which are not, might not have been accurate exactly how it was for example in the Kremlin corridor. We have some paintings which might not have been there, you know, Definitely which, which right. there in reality, but which we, which we, they put up because it felt right you know so so that's just very interesting is you know the, the but johan, authenticity. johan got, kind of came with his views and he had a whole look that he was showing us and he had films that he wanted us to look at which he wanted to influence the way we looked at the real material as well i think mm. i mean there was yeah, quite, there is a strong presence there can you yeah. can can you talk a little, expand a little bit on that, on kind of how you um, brought in kind of fictional visual or tonal references and use them to match up with all of the, the incredibly dense and intense uh, research that you were doing as well? I think for, for him, he, he always kept going on to me, it's got to be chaotic. It mustn't be neat. It must look, um, you know, particularly he was worried about the military. I can remember Jakob going past all the clothes saying, oh, it's going to all be grey. And I said, no, Ukraine likes colour. Uh, he didn't like any cliched 70s looks. They were thrown out straight away. Uh, anything that you thought, oh, that looks quite cool. We found these great Russian stuff out. The costume has it. No, he threw all that, you know. So it's very interesting how, and I kind of got to know what he liked. So Sometimes in the fittings we would be doing military and you just knew that was just not right. He was going to make it more real or, or just push it a little bit. And then I would check with the military advisory and I'd you'd say that was possible, you know, and, and all the, you can particularly see it, I think, in, some, in the military camps that we did, we worked really hard to give a lot of those guys some individual characters. And you can see it a lot in the evacuation, just the chaos with the props all the things we chose together um, with Claire, you know, she would bring all these bags and <laughs> suitcases and, and between us all, we tried to create this kind of um, 
um, just very chaotic sort of situation that wasn't too designed, if you see what I mean, yeah, too thought. Yeah. And I think mm. also, obviously, Jacob is a huge part of creating the atmospheres in each area we were in. You know. And um, Jacob, I'd like to throw it to you and kind of ask you precisely about that, about your preparation and your um, references and your intentions with creating the, the visual landscape of the show. Oh, you know, yes, like we all said, I mean, there was a big kind of knowledge bank that we had access to. I mean, HBO and the entire team had, you know, presented all this research material and, and, and we had time to read all this and to, to discuss this. That, you know, I think we had a very good uh, pre-production time or the length was really good. Uh, so you could have time to really uh, get into it. Uh, but in terms of uh, references, some, in some ways, you one also the director wants to stay away from references, especially film references. You know, we, uh, you know, he talked a lot about Flemish, uh, Flemish painters and uh, this is guy, uh, Hieronymus Bosch, who is depicting hell in many of his paintings. Um, and that was, of course, very different somehow from what we are doing, but it also strikes the tone of, you know, where we are heading towards. So there was a lot of that. And of course, um, the, the book by Svetlana Alexievich was a big kind of uh, reference for all of us to, to uh, the, the soul of, of uh, the nation or the soul of the Soviet Union was kind of captured in that. Mm. Um, so that gave us ideas. And um, yeah, sorry, I can go on. <laughs> Just gonna say, I think for um, Daniel and myself, when we started researching for a lot of the graphic imagery for radiation burns and what have you, we found it very difficult to actually find accurate reference from the time. Um, and we, I mean, we actually, I know we referred to a couple of written pieces which actually documented all the different <coughs> stages of radiation sickness and burns. And um, there was, I mean, there was a little bit of photographic um, evidence we might manage to find, but we actually discovered, I mean, there was actually quite a lot of propaganda sort of material use in, in back in the day uh, during the event so it's a little bit misleading so we did a lot of reference to um, very similar kind of burns and radiation kind of uh, illnesses but um, I think for us on the contrary it was actually quite difficult to find something which, which was actually accurate to the time and the events at Chernobyl. And um, Barry if I can stay with you for a second would you be able to talk a little bit about kind of the the balance that you were trying to strike between, you know, the the research or the lack of references that you could have uh, of the reality of radiation damage and that, how that affects people, but also the, you know, keeping the, the effects dramatic and kind of cinematic and make it work for the story to propel the narrative. Yeah, I think um, it, it was it was interesting because when we when we first started. Um, our research and when we first started developing uh, makeup, uh, doing makeup tests and what have you, um, we, we felt it was going to be quite, it was going to be incredibly graphic no matter what um, we, we showed. So I think, I know Johan was quite keen to play a sort of less is more approach. Um, so I, I think um, as, as, as graphic as the reference was that we were following and the test that we were doing, um, I think we were just, um, um, I think we were just trying to choose key moments during the show where it would sort of hit home how um, how awful um, that the effects were of the radiation burns. So um, I, th I think it was actually um, just it, it was just choosing the right um, the right key scenes, I think, to get it across rather than keep um, plowing the radiation burns, I think. But um, I mean, D Daniel and I, um, I think when, when we first started doing our tests, um, I, I think we knew that it was going to be very graphic for television. Um, I think the important thing for us was the storytelling of all the different stages that these firefighters went through um, from the, the initial sicknesses and the swelling and the redness of the skin um, to um, the, it, 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 was, it was over about. I think it's about four or five stages in the end, Daniel, isn't it? I think um, that we did the uh, radiation burns. Um, so I think it was just choosing key, key moments to show them as best as possible. Thank you. And um, I wanted to use this opportunity really to talk a little bit more in depth about the 
uh, the level of detail that the show has, and you've kind of really illustrated that. And I think, Luke, you had brought uh, over some slides that we can use as reference points. Uh, these are kind of just early tonal boards that we put together just to show what kind of project we were going for. I mean, I think I put these together actually for the pitch before I even got the job. So it, they're a mixture of documentary photography from a guy called Igor Kostin, who was actually able to access the site and was allowed to take pictures and document it at the time, which is pretty amazing. And it's like the bottom left is one of the liquidators having their lead put on before they'd go into a, a dangerous area. And the other photos are much more sort of uh, tonal. It's a, a, a photographer called um, Alexander uh, Gronsky. So it's, um, you can kind of see very early on that we were going for something much more uh, cinematic and dark and, and um, textured and not necessarily we didn't start with authenticity i think that's that's the sort of important thing we started we're trying to work out how we were going to put this incredibly uh, cinematic story with a quite a lot of, which required a lot of scope more than scale um onto uh the screen and uh yeah so i mean these are these are real mix of images but like i was saying you can see that the top and the bottom one in the middle there are real shots of liquidators cleaning the roof of, of yeah. Masha, which you see in the show. And it's, it's quite shocking imagery, but it's also very raw and it's very sort of documentary in vibe. And I think that, you know, that became a kind of starting point. And then um, Johan came with very sort of similar tonal ideas as well. Uh, but I mean, we, we put together hundreds of these boards. It was a real mixture of uh, imagery drawn from the internet, and like, like Odile said, um, she found that so much imagery as well, because once we were over in Lithuania, we had people who were able to access sort of Russian, uh, Russian Google, Russian websites, you know, and really got imagery that we didn't get when we were prepping in London. Hmm. And actually, right, Odile, I mean, yeah, no, I think it was a fantastic um, choice to, I think yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's going to uh, uh, endless, really. I mean, you can see how makeshift they cover the buses with the lead in the bottom left there. I did. I did think um, going to Lithuania and and for all the the difficulties of being an international crew coming into mm. another country to work with. Is there? I did think, and then going to Ukraine, uh, those were gave us huge huge advantages. I got the chance to go to Ukrainian costume houses. I got the chance to go to Belarus, and like Claire, we did the flea markets in Kiev. You know, there was lots of access to things we might not have had if we'd shot it maybe in Hungary or somewhere like that. You know? And the, the Lithuanians were very passionate about it because they'd lived through it. They'd lived through Russian oppression, you know, so some of the older, they kept saying, you just, Odile, you've got to understand, we couldn't have access to anything outside. We had to only get what the fact, what was here. And I, you know, it's quite a hard thing to get your head around sometimes. And the propaganda they were under. Ah. You're back again. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I don't know if you, yeah. You disappeared for a minute there. It's just internet issues. I missed everything you said, Odile. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I was just saying there was an advantage going to Lithuania and uh, usually, yeah, and uh, going to Ukraine. We were, and having access to you know, I mean the flea market. I mean Claire's department used to come back every weekend with suitcases of stuff. It was incredible. <laughs> I, I, I'd come back with 10 suitcases every time I went there. And the, the, the thing about it was what you could actually find was, it, it's just, it's almost like it's, it's a moment in history. You'd walk along, this thing would be on for miles. It would all be down railway tracks where the trains were still going. People would just move all their stuff out the way. Every time a train came down, then they put it back. But you could get everything there and in terms of, period, objects, vases, they, they, I mean, even down to stuff like Nazi uniforms and memorabilia, literally e anything, but it just went on for miles. And it was this constant source of, well, for me, it was a constant source of joy. I couldn't get there enough. <laughs> I couldn't bring back enough. It was That's such good. a thing. It was this, it, it was actually quite magical. I, I wasn't allowed to, every time I spoke, it was a problem. I went, my, the team I went with were brilliant and they direct me, you know, to all these various nooks and crannies. But some of the stuff that you could actually get hold of there, it, 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 was, it was like going into 
various antique houses and prop houses here, but to an extent where you'd never have the choice of things. It was an uh, amazing, the flea markets were amazing. You could get everything there. I know Odile costumes and objects. I mean, it was amazing, wasn't it? It was such a great place. But it made such a difference to the level of detail, didn't it, Claire? Because we were worried from the beginning that we didn't want to make a, it wasn't just about finding period props, 80s props. It was about finding Soviet props. So yeah. I think that was really clear when we started delving into it more being over there um, and it made a big difference to the look of the show I think. Yeah and having access to real Soviet cost clothes that were manufactured in Russia at the time so going into that ancient costume house where I had to wear a full ski outfit because it wasn't heated it was minus six and only the cats were heated um, you know and digging through you know clothes that were on full high but it was a joy it was like a wonderful experience you're not going to get you know and then going to Belarus where it's completely different where you it's all clean folded and but there was no toilet paper <laughs> and the, no the knowledge of the people we were working with I mean a lot of them lived through it that was a daily thing you know I mean right down to how Legasov took out his rubbish it's just you, all these things that you can't find in just normal avenues of research that that really became an obsession for all of us, I think. I think we, we enjoyed it. Really interesting sharing. to mention about, you know, shooting on location and in interacting or having all these, um, having, you know, local crew members. Sorry, I was going to fix my audio one second. Um, yeah, it, that can give some enormous inspiration. And, and uh, in my case, or in our lighting department, we had a very experienced uh, spark who, um, you know, he was an adult even when the, when the Chernobyl happened. And he mentioned to me, he told me um, and that um, he was, he told his kids, so he was told by everyone that you can't go out in the sun. And I thought, that, well, why the sun? Well, the sun was even more dangerous than, than the rain or, or when the atmosphere itself. And I, you know, I grew up in Sweden, but I never heard that the sun would have been, a, <laughs> would have been more scary than, or more dangerous, and there would be more relativity there than anywhere else. But for some reason, they thought that the particles that they saw in the, in the backlit sun, that those part particles, that's when you saw the, the radioactivity. And that kind of triggered for us the, kind of the idea of, of how to light the film how, or how to light Chernobyl and, and lighting for, for a threat or lighting for... Um, that basically like the sun or the rays of the sun, they carry the threat or are, are even the threat or the relativity. So it's, it's, uh, it's enormous. It wasn't, and that, you know, that idea would never have come across if we hadn't been on set, I think, or if we hadn't been in, in Lithuania or in, yeah. in the former Soviet Union. So it's... Mm. Uh, and um, Sana, if I can, if I can bring you a little bit to expand on that point, kind of, can you talk a bit about? You've all spoken so much about kind of the importance of shooting in Lithuania, of being able to access people's accounts, of being able to access the actual objects, the spaces, the places um, that were of the period and people who had those tales. Um, Sana, can you talk a little bit about your experience of finding those right places to shoot the show? You know, both, you know, when combining the logistical producer's um, standpoint and kind of finding the right atmosphere. I mean, I think in a, in a way, we always knew we have to head east just for the right architecture of what remains. And it had to be an ex-Soviet country and that narrows it down. You know, shooting in Russia itself, for example, is incredibly complicated. And of course, one always wants a tax credit, ideally as well, when you go anywhere. And, uh, and that kind of focuses the mind initially. And then, you know, at the choices that you have, I mean, our show had some quite specific requirements. And, you know, the existence of a power plant of the same age as Chernobyl in Ignalina, I mean, it's like two and a half hours out of Vilnius, was a huge draw. Um, not that we initially knew we could film in it more than maybe 25 people for seven hours or a few. Um, and, you know, after six months of, you know, being persistent and having just a dream team and the fantastic work of our Lithuanian location team, we were shooting in it for seven days with 260 crew. Um, um, without knowing that we could really send the, sign the contract two days before the trucks went in. Um, so, you know, it, 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 it kind of, you know, so therefore Lithuania became kind of quite, a, quite an obvious place for, for that possibility alone, because, you know, for us to create the world of Chernobyl, when even if you could go to the real place, it's, it's dilapidated, it's this, you know, we needed it at a time before the explosion too, and, and from this and not grown, overgrown and, so 
me always, you know, being able to combine CG with a location and with a build would hopefully, you know, you know, wonderfully, you know, enable us to kind of pull this off, which was, you know, a huge challenge for everybody, you know, with Luke and Lindsay and our, and our effects team and Jakob, you know, there was so much planning and oh, how do we do it? And that became a part of it. And yet, Vilnius being quite a, um, you know, quite a small city and Kona is the second city where we shot as well. We also knew for some of the elements of our storytelling, we needed something that had a bigger city. And, um, and we, we also really wanted to, because we are drama and we were very much like, you know, doing a drama. But to then at the very end, I think it is so captivating and you get you know, you go on this journey and we just always knew at the end of it, an epilogue where you actually see, this is not only a story, guess what? This is real, here are the real people. It was just a real important bookmark for it. So we always knew we had to go to Ukraine and we had to make it part of it. And then we were lucky that really in Kiev and, and the surroundings, we found the missing links that, that enabled us to shoot meaningfully, you know, a city like Moscow, although we did, we covered that together from various things too. Um, so, you know, finding that base was, was relatively easy and yet we were really lucky. I mean, you know, the Pripyat that we recreated for the, uh, for the evacuation, I think we could have all never hoped that we would find something that was so fitting and so, you know, enabled us to shoot what we, what we ended up with and that, you know, how extraordinary the population was of allowing us to disrupt so many people's lives you know for for some time so yeah you know you you hope you get it right and see you know and then the ingredients were there and we were then blessed with you know wonderful spirit of the people thank you and i kind of wanted to ask for for everyone um kind of about the experience of working and shooting at the decommissioned power plant. You know, you mentioned kind of the importance of the fact that it's um, sort of coetaneous to Chernobyl's power plant as well. Um, and how did that help you kind of with understanding the, the scope of, of the disaster when making the show? Well, yeah, I mean, only from my, oh, well, only from my point of view is uh, getting in it at the beginning was actually very useful because we actually under, allowed us to understand what the power plant was. It demystified it in a way. It is just a lot of endless, uh, long uh, concrete corridors and steps. And, and that became a really interesting thing from a design point of view to open up that just, although that was all set at the beginning, it was, um, it was like a maze and not understanding where you were within the building was actually really interesting. So actually as we didn't even know we could use the location at that point, but it was very useful in understanding what, the power plant should be uh, which isn't something out of nasa or anything like that it's it's like a water pumping station with a fission core in the middle so it um that that was really fascinating and the materials that it's made up of and and became a real keynote for us but um in terms of working i think other people can expand more it was just took a lot of organization we had to be very organized in order to get the things that we needed in the power plant for the days we needed them but in terms of scope on the exterior it, it really opened up the the size of the plant which is about three kilometers long not not something we could tell with our backlog set alone so yeah we were, we, there was strict um you know security there that was quite funny we all had to have passes and we all had to be put into groups and we weren't allowed to stray anywhere it's a bit like good training for covid as we find yeah. out <laughs> yeah well we all had to we all had to get dressed to go into when we first went into Igalina, we had to actually get dressed in our this very current this kind of ppe but we had to wear a certain amount of clothing and shoes and various things to actually go in there um, so it, yeah, some, you know, they did shoot it took quite a while to get actually through the door before we actually got in there, and that was when we were filming as well. It was quite, it was quite a chore. And um, Daniel, if I can go to you um, now, could you talk a little bit about um, some of the learnings really from both the science, the science of radiation to generation um, that informed your work, and kind of the that particular. Soviet aesthetic that was going on at that time that's sort of different from um, 
images that we potentially have kind of on the, on the Western side of the world? Wow, well, that's a difficult question to answer. I mean, the, the thing, I think the thing with the makeup hair and the prosthetics, it was all about actually authenticity uh, and getting it right and mm -hmm. giving respect to the people that were actually there. Now that went across the board um, from the Politburo right the way through to all the extras, right the way through to the prosthetics. Mm. Uh, giving everybody the right look, but credit for where they belong in the structure as well. Um, it, yeah, it, it was all about authenticity, really. Thank you. And um, kind of you, you meant you've been extremely collaborative and complementary of each other, even in the process of this Q and A. So I kind of wanted to. Um, if I may ask you a little bit to dig in deeper into how all of your teams collaborated to keep the series visually coherent. I mean, I think it's just before, you know, for, it's all communication. It's mm -hmm. all about, you know, not just sitting there and looking at one part of it that, of course, each department does do, but actually, you know, looking further and seeing how does this part fit with that part. Any coherent storytelling, you know that all the departments and all this detail and everything has been talked through, communicated, exchanged, mulled over together, and nobody just in isolation has an idea that then actually clashes with something else. I think, you know, and... I think we were all so passionate and it was one of these projects that I think everybody somewhat felt a calling to have to do. And, and I think it was just something that naturally happened where then led me as a producer to observe that you dream about it. You hope your team will be like that. And, you know, and, and, and we were just blessed and it really was. And I think that is the coherent, you know, and very successful, um, you know, show that you see at the end. And, you know, without communication and collaboration, we would have done individually beautifully and amazingly wonderful things, but it wouldn't have come together in just the same way. And I think that is a huge credit to all our heads of department, you know, and Johans and, and Craig Mason's kind of very clear, you know, vision where we all, where we, we never, we, we only ever argued over tiny details. We always shared this overall, the vision of where we are going. And I think you see that too. I think I, I completely agree with that. And going back to the, the last question you were asking me, I, that, that is one of the great things. We all understood the period. We all worked together so closely and it's such an amazing team. I mean, in 40 years of working in the business, I, it's been so rare I've come across a team like this. I mean, absolutely incredible. The communication was uh, pretty much unique, um, which made my job uh, a lot easier because everybody had their pools of reference. Uh, the art department had their pools of reference. A deal costume had their pools of reference. There was the main pool of reference from HBO and Craig and Johan and all of this made everything just coherent it made everything work together um so we were we were just we were all on the same page uh, i think being away together don't you think um being all away together in a small little town yeah um also makes a bonding you know very a strong bonding between the team you know and we all had to bring along with us our Lithuanian teams of you know they're all different i mean i had quite a huge big team luke had a huge team um, luckily, they were really pleased we weren't doing a Western version. I think they have a lot of companies that come in and want to do kind of like a Western version. And they were very, my team at least, were very pleased uh, to be doing, doing the Russian, you know, the real Russian. They were kind of so passionate about it themselves to make a true story, a, well, a story like the, the, the visuals that we were going for. But being away was interesting. <laughs> I guess they have said that before also. It was it was more than a film or a TV series. It's you know we all had an enormous kind of responsibility, and we felt we were you know uh, you know we were honoured to be able to tell the story. And it was it was you know we have all made many films and shows, but this was un unusual in that sense that this was you know uh, you know we had to pass on something to the next generation or to inform the world about this. So it was it was. Um, 
you know, almost like a biblical like, kind of assignment to, to put on all of us. <laughs> so kind of stranded in a in a in a in a foreign in foreign country, which wasn't you know that foreign. It was very friendly, but it was you know. And um, yeah, so we, it was like everyone said, it was very unusual that it it was just you know harmonious. <laughs> well, I think so at least, but it was it was uh, very very unusual. And um, did you have a favorite moment of the of the making of the of the show? Ooh. If you can pick just one. Um, no, it was all pretty hard. Uh, the, <laughs> um, the, I, I don't know. I think it just does come back to there was a real sense of importance made even more important by being out there and working with people who, who this story belonged to. Um, it was, I mean, there's so many things to be proud of, but I mean, within that, there's a lot of, achievements with like the control room became a set that, that became very that worked very well for us I, I the whole backlog just became a real um puzzle that, that came together so well and Lindsay's not here but he was such a huge part of that the VFX producer so um and then uh, use of location for me I mean I've never been on a job so successfully using your location the owner's our location manager worked so hard to get us what we wanted and um, and there was not a single location we went into where we didn't do something with it in order to bring it in line with what we wanted to do with the show. And uh, but between that and the the, the scale offered and in Kiev and the interesting locations offered there, we, it really gives the show a unique flavour. And so, no, there is no one thing, but but those highlights of how you do your job, I suppose, mm -hmm. were very special on this. Yeah, my highlight was to have a, a proper textile department to to be able to break down all the clothes because we had a lot of um, ex-army stuff and we had to break it all down and the miners' costumes. I mean, there was a huge amount of work put into each of those military costumes. And, you know, we, Johan would say, I don't want them to all be the same. So we'd go away and sort of bleach a few. And uh, so there was a lot of work on that side. And then all the wounds combining our work with um, uh, Daniel. So somebody during that whole uh, first part of the explosion, everyone's getting wounded. So we had to, to sometimes shoot out a sequence. So you never quite knew where, what was gonna happen to the costumes, particularly all the engineers' costumes. So they, were, they all had a sequence of events to, to, of different levels of, of destruction that were going on in their clothes. So, um, and when we shot in, was it, we shot it in Kiev, outside Kiev, the miners' scene, and we all came back covered in dust. I thought that was quite funny. There's some great pictures of all of the whole crew covered in black yes. dust. <laughs> I don't know if you, Jakob, will remember that, I'm sure. Yes. <laughs> I also yeah. remember one bit very particularly after months of prepping in the bitter cold where everything was full of snow and ice and months and months, was, we had up to minus 23. And we had to imagine a lot of the exterior locations of, oh, how would they look for sleeves? <laughs> um, and, oh, is it the right flooring and will it be period appropriate? Uh, um, you know, and then we really needed, you know, you know the time the <laughs> Chernobyl exploded, it was April and it was weather that was like summer. It was really warm and all the references, it was certainly not raining. And, uh, and somehow miraculously, about two days before we turned over, the frost turned into 19 degrees and we had wonderful weather all throughout. We only lost one hour through rain. So um, I, I will never forget it turning warm after this punishing cold. And, um, um, just, just, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, there, there, there was, I mean, several times on, during the shoot that I was just amazed by just everybody's work and, and, the, and the performance of the actors just across yeah, the board. Just the fantastic, and just fantastic quality work. But there was one time I particularly remember, I mean, it was very, very important to me to get the burns right with Barry, to get, to get these burns right. And, to, and as he said, it was very, very hard to get reference. There wasn't any. Um, and what there was was very unclear. So it was, spent a long time doing research, reading and reading and reading. But anyhow, we were, we were very busy on set and uh, in the makeup rooms. And I was there in the makeup rooms and Vasily, our main character who we see in the last stage just before he dies, is in a hospital bed. And I kind of, I walk onto set and I pass a monitor 
and I hadn't seen him in situ at all. And I passed this monitor and I look at it, I, it blew my mind completely because it looked just like one of the very few pieces of reference we had of Basili. And until somebody's lying down in situ with the lighting, with everything right, mm -hmm. you don't realize that you've actually got it right. And even, I mean, it really uh, is quite emotional even now. It, it was an amazing thing to know that one had got it right but, and was playing, paying the right respect to the people that had died. Yeah. So that, that was very important. I, I just want to say, because you're talking about that, that, that it was the only time where oh, I, I've stayed on set when we were in the hospital. Um, and one of the, it was, um, uh, it was Paul Ritter, he was Dyatlov. And there was a scene and I thought, oh, I'd watch it on the monitor just before I go off to another set to do some dressing. And I stood there and watched it and, and it actually made me cry. And that's n never happened to me or anything. It really, it touched me emotionally. And it was the same when I walked down through the corridors of the hospital and it was the first time I'd seen the guys in makeup. And I, I felt really, really emotional. It was, it really, really touched me. And that, that never happens to me because I, you know, we're, we're all used to seeing so many different things. We all know it's smoke and mirrors, but the, the weight of the show and the weight of the responsibility of the, this was something that was real, that was, uh, that is actually a current situation. The fact that it's not a resolved event, because obviously, as we know, the radiation is still an active thing in Chernobyl. But I, I've never felt that kind of emotion when I've been on set ever, because normally it's like, oh, we've got to move this, we've got to put that there, we've got to get, you know, I've got a million things going on. But actually, it was the first time ever that I've ever cried at anything while I was while I was working. It really touched me. Thank you so much to everyone for sharing that. And um, just before I open up for questions from the, from the audience, um, I wanted to ask you kind of now with the show out and having received so many accolades and so much it's such an amazing reception, um, how does it feel to be nominated for this piece of work? Well, always feel extraordinary and a real honor. You know, it is finding recognition and a wide audience is always a very, very special thing. Um, especially when, you know, everybody worked so hard and getting that recognition across the board makes me super happy and thrilled for all our teams who I believe, you know, really deserve it so much. And, and you know, and it is also a place where you really realize how much we did reach an audience. And, and that is just a fantastic feeling. And, you know, we can never have enough of those. It just I also feeling like we hit the tone that we were setting out for, like in, in the feedback that came back and people from Russia making comments about both authenticity, but also emotionally in reaction to the show. That was very satisfying in a way that you don't always get. And um, like knowing that we set out on a journey that was very hard, but everyone at every level truly cared about it. And as Odile said, we worked so closely together and with, with Johan and everyone as well. And then to actually have achieved that as you kind of pictured it, it was, uh, yeah, it's rare. And so therefore to be then recognized for it is, yeah, it's very special, I think. Well, um, I think we've got, well, we've got some time for audience questions and we've got a few already come in. So I'm going to read them out and make them quick fire so we can get as many in as possible. So there's, uh, there's a couple of questions about working in Lithuania from Jacob and one of them has sort of already been answered. So I'm going to ask one of them. So seeing Chernobyl and Stranger Things produced in Lithuania, do you think Lithuania is becoming, is becoming a new hub for productions? Increasingly so, yes, you know, as, as you know, there's more bigger production successfully coming through it, you know, you know, they'll grow their small industry and I think they'll make it a hub that will grow, yes. Um, and another one kind of from Louise about the research, which you've all really emphasized. Did you come up against a wall in terms of some of the information being classified, especially in terms of the reactor and what happened? More of a cray question that one because a lot of that uh, those things had been thought out by him. I mean, there's a lot of good books that 
break down what happened on the night. So I don't think we ever came across any classified information, did we, Claire? No. I just think it was more just, no. yeah. No, I mean, I think the truth has come out with, with it, you know. I mean, it took a long time before, you know, yeah. access was, but, I, you know, classified, not as such. And yet, of course, there will always be files that were, you know, from the former Soviet Union that, you know, you will not find or get access to somewhere along the line just because it's just a, you know, a complicated system to source and find things. Mm -hmm. I mean, we did have a moment to... Uh, regards using the Russian military uniforms, I don't know if you, if you remember that little pat moment, but actually with the, um, the fall of, of, the, of the Soviet Union, in fact, nothing was patented in costumes, except a couple of t-shirts I was told by the team I couldn't use that were, that somebody had patented, but actually everything to a certain extent just collapsed and nobody had done it. And so we were using a lot of ex-military and uh, stock that we got from Russia or Poland or through various eBay's. And um, on that note, Robert asks, has the series has the series been shown in Russia? I, I don't know if it's been shown, yes, but people have definitely watched it. <laughs> no, yes, it, uh, yes, it has been shown, and you know, and I think overall it was rather a success. Hmm. And um, from Caroline, and this is for Jakob mostly, amazing cinematography. Can I ask you how you came to be involved with Chernobyl? Uh, I don't know. Uh, yeah, it's a good question. Uh, how I came involved, I, um, I was on another film in Hungary, which just fell apart. Uh, and then um, I had a film in, in New York screening, and I told Johan, which I've been well, we have known each other since before. I told him about my project, my film, show me New York, please go and see it, uh, kind of thing. And uh, he said, okay, by the way, I will go and see that film. And by the way, do you want to read the script? And that's how we kind of came about. And um, another question from Christopher. Uh, it was amazing that how even some of the most um, quote unquote Hollywood moments here, like when the helicopter crashes were based on reality. Did you find yourselves having to downplay the extraordinary reality sometimes to maintain believability? Uh, you know, that he references the diverse torches all failing. Was that real or was that for dramatic tension? And that he loved the hand cranked torches. Uh. Well, I mean, the, the hang crank torches was a decision, um, but the, uh, well, we, we did a lot of research into it and actually the, the most difficult part of it, and, and that's, I'm going to pass that to you, Jakob, it was, it was the, the actual light of it because everything was all about the light of the torches and obviously they were getting dimmer and of course they, they, they would have died because of the radioactivity, but that was always, it was a, it was a major problem, the, the, the torches and the light from the torches and how we were going to do with that. Jakob, if you remember. Yeah, I think no one really knows what happens. Yeah, I guess, yeah, kind of, but I think, well, no one really knows, not even fully Craig maybe what happened inside those um, the catacombs of Chernobyl. So, uh, yeah, so I guess it was kind of brainstorming and partly based on research, but it was also kind of, invented i guess a bit on i don't know exactly what happened but maybe that's what happened you know maybe that's it maybe we told based on all our kind of knowledge we kind of created a, a fiction or reality which was uh, the true but and generally i think that it's you know it's, it's really a, a bit of everything you know the the helicopter crashing you know over the plant that is something we can find on video and we really had to you know wanted to portray that very truthfully or you know the 90 seconds on the roof you can find that and we really wanted to for that to be incredibly truthful and yet there's other moments like when you think about the iconic moment of the people from Pripyat standing on the which is now called the bridge of death and marveling in the wonder of light you know from a, from the burning plant you know they all died um, and you know and of course we took dramatic license by telling the story point and you know and, and you know to get the right emotional impact and connection so so you pick and choose you know in line with what the story you know demands and 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 wants to offer and um a question an anonymous question for claire uh, could you talk a little bit about your process in dressing the explosion in in dressing the explosion. 
Well, to be honest, I've, I wouldn't have thought I would be so interested in rubble and wreckage and debris. I, I, was literally, I literally got obsessed with it. I'd be driving past the place and, and I'd see like piles of rubble and I'd stop. The, the thing of it was that um, we, we just had so much rubble coming in. It was actually quite hard to find in the end because we, it had to be the right kind of debris um, in terms of what the rebar was and the concrete. and I, I, it, it seems like um, this, this set itself was huge and, I, and actually I was thinking before when you were talking about moments on set and I remember going in early, walking up the mound, which was absolutely vast and it was muddy and dusty and you know we'd, we'd have hard hats on and everything and I walked up it with a cup of tea going against all my rules of no drinks on set. And I sat in the middle of it and the scope of it, the size of it, the scale of it and all and I know what it took to get the rubble and the wreckage in. But yeah, every time I saw a derelict building or a pile of concrete, I would get very excited, <laughs> which is but quite unusual for me, even now. The process though, I mean, you can't dress that by hand. So we were dressing it with machines, um, yeah, it was like because... a dance with machines and a megaphone and various things. And um, in terms of sourcing the concrete, we were actually marking buildings that were marked for demolition and taking them. We were taking roads up for the tarmac that we put down, that were being <laughs> that were being redone anyway. And um, and like we were saying, Claire, some things uh, like the rebar and things like that, they actually had to be soft because we had people going up through the rubble. So there was a lot of things to balance and work out, and all the special effects were underneath that set. So we had to create a mesh and dress on top of it. It's actually, for what it looks, a very complicated pile of rubble, but um, that went through several stages and, and to be honest, was pushed right to the limit in terms of actually achieving that in its fullest, um, almost up to the point of the shoot, because we uh, have so many different layers and aspects to it. But yeah, it was like, it was, it was I, you could talk for a long time, Claire, I think about the process. I could, <laughs> I could go details, I don't want to bore you. But yeah, it's, it was a really, really complicated set. For, for a pile of debris, very complicated. <laughs> what, what was really interesting about the sets, also this amazing, enormous exterior sets, that often there were also interior sets. While well, you mm -hmm. climb that pile of rubbish, so to speak, you enter the you entered the interior set of a corridor which might have led you to the control room. So that was, for me, uh, enormous, uh, I mean, very unusual and enormous help in order to get into the, um, into the atmosphere of creating Chernobyl. I mean, part of that early design ambition was that, wasn't it? Yeah, I mean, it was like, how could we not necessarily have to keep it flowing, but how, how could we give the option to be flowing where possible to keep, stay with the action and stay with the people? And so, that building essentially was an unfinished studio and we knocked holes in it where we need to knock holes in it. We worked off the basis that that pile of rubble was destroyed, not the reactor, it was actually the pump room in front of the reactor that had been destroyed by the explosion. And so that room that you can look out from above the rubble is the same set that you can then walk up the girder into that and then through all the corridors and through the inside of the destroyed reactor, it really was quite a, a composite set that fed through from the back lot into the, um, into the what was the stages, I suppose. We, we all needed maps in order not to get lost in this <laughs> labyrinth of sets. Yeah. But it, it's, um, and um, quite, a, quite a technical question from Andrew for Jacob. Um, how many cameras were you shooting with at any one time? And if you can go into what they were and what lenses you were using. And a second part to that question is how much of a role did the second unit play in picking up the additional details and scenes? Yeah, no, we had, well, for some scenes we had uh, in one camera and uh, for other scenes we could have maybe five, six set, uh, five, six cameras running at the same time, I think, or maybe four. I mean, two cameras were running often at the same time and then... And then the end we had three cameras a lot, didn't we? I mean, yeah. we, kind of, we started with two cameras permanent and then added for big scenes, but in the end we shot mostly with three cameras. Yeah. And, and, uh, and then sometimes we had three kind of cameras up in the air as well, three drones running around <laughs> or flying around at the same time. So sometimes there were six cameras running. Uh, but as in terms of the second unit, yeah, extremely, extremely crucial. And we were, we had this, um, yeah, this amazing team, second unit team who, um, who did amazing, amazing work. And once again, who became, you know, there was not just a second unit team who went off on their own. Well, they were on their own, but they were also 
very much part of the team and they were giving a lot of pre-production time and and had a lot of time to talk so it was never you know them and us so it, it felt like we were one still one unit and, and we were able to communicate uh, you know uh, well with each other and uh, yeah so so we're extremely lo- lucky with Mons Monson and JP Passi, the, the DOP on on um, on the second unit, who did some amazing, amazing shots and well scenes as well. Thank you. And, and, and so the lenses, yeah, we had uh, Cook uh, um, Cook Pancros, uh, which were not the rehoused on old Cook Pancros. Thank you. Um, and a question, I think, more for um, Barry and Daniel, really. Um, I've seen from Mel. I've seen that specific tattoo transfers were used to create and recreate the burn makeups in the show. Was this done for speed or in continuity or due to the size of the makeup and went and what went into the design and use of these tattoos? Um, Barry, do you mind if I answer that? Absolutely, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, the tattoos, yeah, the tattoos were an idea that I had um, very, very early on because it was something that I was actually going to do for a, a Japanese zombie movie. Um, uh, believe it or not, which is probably not the best thing to refer to uh, in in the game centre of Chernobyl. But the, what I wanted to do was get have all the colour coming from underneath the prosthetics and not having any colour on top. So, but I realised that in order to paint the actors, this would uh, this would actually take an enormous amount of time. And so uh, we designed with my with my tattoo design team. We designed these, these, they're basically transfers and they're very complex with different colors and different shapes. And so all that those colors would come through underneath the prosthetics and the prosthetics themselves were also clear in some areas, opaque in other areas. Some areas touched down actually on the tattoo. So you sort of clear, clearly saw the tattoo. And so it was all at different, different levels and uh, of color and different thicknesses of prosthetics that actually made the feeling that everything, all this injury was coming from below. But the tattoos, what the tattoos did for us, the main thing they did for us is that what would have taken hours to, to have painted onto the actor, I took less than an hour. I mean, depending on what we were doing, sometimes just minutes, because you just go, you put all those on and then you could concentrate on, on using the prosthetics and putting them on correctly. So they, they were a very, very good and effective idea. It's quite a bit of trial and error as well, isn't it, I think, because we were trying to, uh, we were contradicting what we would normally do because with prosthetics, you put a pigment into the uh, appliances to make it flesh tonable. So it has a level of opacity to it and the less, um, pigment you'd put in the, the prosthetics, the more waxy things would look when it starts to look quite translucent. But in actual fact, that's that's what we were after, was for the actual finish of the skin to actually look quite translucent and waxy. So we went against everything that we would normally do really. So it's quite a bit of R&D and getting the levels of the tattoos correct as well. So the vibrancy was strong enough to show through. Like Daniel was saying, have, you know, the thicknesses kind of changed throughout all the forms really so you had uh, lots of sense of depth in one area and then the the surface of the, the prosthetic itself sort of um rubbed more in others so um it's, it's one of the most complicated things i have ever worked on i think it, uh, it was uh i mean it, but it was it was incredibly um uh, rewarding at the end of it i think i think i think the thing is what barry's saying as well is that uh we actually broke a, a cardinal a cardinal rule in the fact that you have to put color into prosthetics in order that they look like skin. And when somebody said, you've got to put color in, you've got to put color in, because otherwise it'll look waxy. I just said, yes, exactly. And so that's that's really, with in conjunction with the tattoos uh, and these, these great prosthetics, I mean, that's what made it work and gives it all that, that reality. To be honest with you, it is how it should look. It's quite horrible. Um, and one final question um, to start wrapping up the conversation from Christopher. Any costume, makeup, or prosthetic thoughts on the miners specifically, both clothed and unclothed? And they were amazing. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think, um, as I said before, we did do a huge amount of 
of work on those miners' clothes, breaking them down and making them dusty. But the day we came to, you know, dress them all naked, it was kind of like makeup and costume just joined in together. <laughs> and we just went in there and broke them down and put all the dust on them and they were good sports, really. And uh, yeah, the, min the miners were absolutely fantastic. And I, I have two little things to say about them. When we were actually in, in this mine, I mean, in this whole area, everything was black, the crew was black, everything was black. It was a definite continuity problem because <laughs> the, it was windy and there was all this black dust and it just kept on building up on the actors and they were kind of blacker and blacker and blacker. We had to having to take it off and then they'd be black again within minutes. It, it was very interesting. And, and we, our wonderful editors managed to cut around it and make it work. The other thing that was incredible with the miners, there was this long debate about whether they should be naked or not for this scene, which of course they, they, they were and they should be, but you know, t television and all that. And so, I, I was always, yeah, they've got to be naked, they've got to be naked, they'd be absolutely fantastic. But I actually didn't know the, what really happened I mean, and what the decision was. And so I came on to set that night shoot and I walked around the corner, just fantastic, because there they were, all stark bollock naked, and it was fantastic. It was right, loved it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, thank you so much for taking so many and answering so openly to all of the audience questions. Just to wrap up the, the q and I've got a, a final question for all of you, really. Um, something that the last few months have really shown us is just how important television is for people and how important it is to create cultural, widespread cultural conversation. Um, with that in mind, what do you see um, for creativity in television for the future? The big question to end on. You know <laughs> what? I have high hopes. I think, you know, we are living in a very difficult time, but we are, you know, and we will overcome that and get through this. And we are also an adaptable bunch and we will work our way through it. And, you know, and it, that will be hard, but we will manage. And I see a very, you know, good future for it because there's daring commissioners, a lot of, you know, you know um, uh, outlets, you know, a lot of streaming and a lot of people that are producing and they're interested you know, in different stories. And it's not all just superheroes, you know, this, this bigger market has enabled stories like Chernobyl to actually become a reality and be commissioned by Chernobyl. And, and I think that world will, will remain and we will return to that. We just have to buckle down and, and, you know, and safely and positively work through these difficult times. I think there's also the joy of being a collaborative team. There's nothing you cannot, it's just the minute you get, you have a break and then you go back on it, back and you think, oh, this is so much, you know, just talking and creating something. It's really why we're there. And, and that's why it was special on Chernobyl because we were all so passionate about it and, and really enjoyed working together. And I think you'd never take that away. You can never lose that. And um, I look forward to working with everybody again one day, hopefully. <laughs> yes. Well, thank you so much. I just want to say one other thing. Yeah, sorry. The thinking about what is happening at the moment, I mean, it, it's terrible. I and mean, it's a real, real challenge for our business. Uh, because we touch each other and we, we're in very, very close contact, especially on, on my side of things. But film people, a race of their own, they're a breed, and they're very, very adaptable. And so it will work, we will find a way of making it work, because there is also the demand. And we love our work. So yeah, I, I, I think film people, they can, they can make it just about anything work. That's such a lovely note to end on as well. And I just want to thank you all. Thank you to our speakers um, for your time, for your insight and for your amazing work. And congratulations again on your much, much, much deserved nominations. Um, thank you again for a supporting partner of the sessions, TCL. And just to make uh, just to make a note, coming up later this afternoon is the making of Fleabag. So head over to the BAFTA YouTube channel to watch that or set a reminder to watch it um, when it's live. And I really hope that everybody who's been tuning in has enjoyed the discussion and stay tuned for more details on where to watch both the British Academy Television Craft Awards and the Virgin Media British Academy Television Awards. And thank you to 
all of you again for making Chernobyl and for spending some time with us this afternoon. Thank Bye. you for having us. Thank you. Bye everybody. Look after yourselves. Yes. Bye. Bye. Bye.